Hello there. My name is Minister Barton Aaron Porter, and today we're going to go into our Father's Word for another exciting Bible study. Now, I'm going to be using the good old King James Version of the Holy Bible, as I always do. So I encourage you to get your Bibles out and to study along with me. Let's approach our Heavenly Father's throne with a word of prayer before we get into this video. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we come with bowed heads and humble hearts, confessing our many sins, Lord, asking that you forgive us, wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. We put all our hope and trust in that precious blood he shed for us at Calvary, Lord. And we ask right now, Almighty God, that you fill us with your precious Holy Spirit as we go into your word, the Holy Bible. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we thank you, Almighty God, for hearing our prayer. Amen. Mark chapter 12, verse 1. And he began to speak to them by parables. Now, we need to know what a parable is before I go any further. A parable, when you look it up, is 3850 in the Strong's Concordance. Per ole. And it comes from another word that means a similitude. That's something that's like something, but not exactly the thing. It says that is symbolically a fictitious narrative of common life conveying a moral. Okay, also it has an adage. So it's an expression where you use symbolic language to teach a literal lesson. Now I'm going to tell you what this parable means as we do it verse by verse. He says in verse one again, a certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and dig a place for the wine fat and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. You need to know what husbandmen are. Husbandmen, when you look it up, a land worker that is farmer. So that's what a husbandman is. So what is he saying? He's saying that God Almighty created the nation of Israel, and Israel was supposed to be a nation of priests. That's why he called them. He was going to make them a nation of priests to teach the truth to everybody. This is what he's talking about in this parable. Verse 2, and at the season he sent to the husbandmen a servant that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. Verse 3 says, and they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. So when they came to see if they got any fruit from the vineyard, from the grapes, they beat them up. Okay, literal translation. When God sent his prophets to Israel, they didn't treat them very good. They weren't trying to hear what they were talking about. The Lord sent them in to call them to repentance and start worshiping them false gods. They beat them and told them, get out of here, scram. They were busy worshiping false gods and doing their own thing. Verse four, and again, he sent to them another servant and at him, they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. So God would send more prophets back into Israel and they physically attacked them. And then five says, and again, he sent another and him they killed and many others beating some and killing some. And that is the truth. When you read the Old Testament stories of the prophets that God kept sending to call Israel to repentance the kings were having them executed. We don't want to hear what you got to say. Beat it. Okay. Verse six. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, 
he sent him also last to them saying, they will reverence my son. Now y'all know what, what Christ is really teaching here. He's teaching how he came after having sent several prophets to call them to repentance. The son of God came and in the parable, it says they will reverence the son. They're going to respect him. Let's see what happens. Seven, but those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. Eight, and they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. So he's talking about how the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and all these corrupt leaders in Israel were going to plot and kill him. And the only reason they were able to do that because God allowed it. He came into the world for that reason to die for us as the Lamb of God, to shed his precious blood for us at Caffrey. That's the only reason they were able to accomplish it. Then he puts a question to them in verse 9. Listen. What shall therefore the Lord of the, of the vineyard do? What is Jehovah going to do about these people who killed his son? They answered, he will come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard to others. So they knew the answer. He's going to come and destroy those who killed his son and give the vineyard to others. So what is, let's give you the modern day translation of this parable. In other words, after you kill me, God is going to turn to the Gentiles. And they are going to answer the call. And they are going to become that royal nation of priests. And they are going to spread the gospel all over the world, just like you see happening right now. All right. And so that's what the parable actually means. Verse 10. And Jesus said, and have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. That's verse 10, verse 11. This was the Lord's doing and it was marvelous in our eyes. So he took them back to the books of the prophets and he quoted how it said they were going to reject the chief cornerstone, the main stone that was supposed to be laid at the foundation and everything else supposed to be built upon it. Referring to himself. Verse 12 says, and they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. So they knew he was talking about them. They didn't like that. They want to lay hands on him, but they feared all the people who believed in him and who were out there present. So they're like, okay, we're going to catch him one day. We'll catch him one day when he ain't around all these people. We'll take good care of him. All right, so verse 13 says, and they sent to him certain of the Pharisees and Herodians to catch him in his word. So they sent certain people out to try to trap him in his words so they can have something to accuse him and bring him into a corrupt court system where he couldn't get a fair break and have him sentenced and put to death. That was their plan, okay? All right, verse 14. And when they would come, they say to him, Master, we know that you are true and cares for no man, for you regard not the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Now notice they came with flattery, right? Then they says, is it lawful to give tribute or pay taxes to Caesar or not? 15, shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I might see it. So he knew they were full of, you know what, when they came trying to flatter him. He says, why tempt you me? Bring me a penny 
that I might see it. 16. And they brought it. And he said to them, whose is this image and superscription? Whose picture on this penny? And they said to him, Caesar's. 17. And Jesus answering said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. He is the wisest who ever set foot on planet earth. So they were no match for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Christ said, show me a penny. Whose picture is that? Whose writing is that? Caesar's? Okay, well, give what belongs to Caesar to Caesar and give what belongs to God to God. <laughs> I love it. And that's the way you and I are supposed to be today. Render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Remember that. And give what belongs to God to God. 18. Then come to him the Sadducees, another denomination, which say there is no resurrection. Now this denomination don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they come to him and they asked him saying, 19, that was 18, Master, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed to his brother. And that was God's law among Israel back then. If a brother died and having no child, the living brother could take his widow as a wife, a second wife. He had more than one wife back then. And that way his name would continue. So that was God's law back then. Notice I said back then. 20. Now there were seven brothers and the first took a wife, dying left no seed, left no child. 21. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed, any child. And the third likewise. 22. And the seven had her and left no seed, last of all, the woman died also. So they thought they had him, right? There were seven brothers, Lord, and they all, one by one, got married to this woman. And when one died, the next one married him, and they had no kids, and it repeated itself all the way until the woman died. 23, here's their question. In the resurrection, which they don't believe in, remember? They don't believe that nobody's going to be raised from the dead. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. They thought they had Jesus. We got him now. <laughs> What's that says? Whose wife is she going to be, Jesus? Look what the Lord says. 24. And Jesus answering said to them, do you not therefore err? He says, you making a big mistake because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. 20, 25, that's 24. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Then he went on to say, 26, and as touching the dead, that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Not I will be, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 27. Jesus said, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. So he tried to educate them. Y'all don't even know what the scriptures teach about the state of the dead. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people to this day that don't understand that. 
I have a Bible study titled, What Happens After Death? I encourage you to study with me on that subject if you haven't done it already. You need to understand what would happen to you if you died right now, faithful to Christ. Verse 28. And one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? So one of the scribes came with a question. Now, a scribe was a person who was dedicated to the copying of God's law by hand. Because there were no printing press back when Christ walked the earth. So that every copy had to be written out. And they had to be very careful not to make mistakes. So if you write something out, over and over and over and over and over and over and over, it's going to become part of you. That's why they refer to them sometimes as doctors of the law. So he said, I'm fixing. I know the law. Let me go ask them, which is the first commandment of all? 29. And Yeshua answered him, the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. 30, and thou shall love the Lord thy God, or you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Then he says in verse 31, and the second is like, namely this, you will love your neighbor as yourself. There is none of a commandment greater than these. Verse 32. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, you have said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other than he. These are the one, the two that everything hangs upon. Everything hangs upon these two commandments. So don't think that he did away with the 10. Now, if you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then you're going to do what he tells you. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The first four tells us how to love and worship God. Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. Thou shalt not make any graven image of anything on earth, under earth, or in the earth. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If you love God, you're going to practice those four things. The last six tells you how to show love to your fellow creation. Honor your mother and your father that your days may be long. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not kill. I'm not saying them in order, but that's what the Ten Commandments are. They're instructions on how to love God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the first four. And the last six are instructions on how to show love to your fellow creation. You got to understand that. I got a Bible study titled where the Ten Commandments done away with. I encourage you to study with me on that subject if you have it. So that's why Christ answered the way he answered. In another one of the synoptic gospels, he quoted this and then he said, upon these two hang all the law and the prophets and everything. So when somebody tries to come and say, this is all we got to do, we don't have to do the Ten no more. No, this was just a Summary of all 10 in these two, 33. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength. And to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So the scribe had to agree with what Jesus said, 34. And when Jesus saw that, he answered discreetly. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. He said, okay, I finally found one of y'all that got a little sense. <laughs> you, you didn't try to 
uh, go against what I said because you know what I said was correct. And you praise me for telling it like it is. He says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that does ask him any questions. After that, they like, man, let's just leave it alone. Let's give it a rest. He's too smart for us. 35, and Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David or David when you look it up and take it all the way back to the Hebrew? How, how do they say Christ is David's son? 36, for David or David himself said by the Holy Ghost, he's quoting the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. 37. David therefore himself called him Lord. And from whence or from what place is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. So he was putting questions out that he knew they couldn't answer because the spirit hadn't enlightened them. 38. And he said to them in his doctrine, listen, beware of the scribes which loved to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces. The word salutations, it simply means a greeting in person or by letter. 39, and the chief seats in the synagogues. They like to sit at the top of the synagogue where everybody can see them. They love to be in the spotlight. And the uppermost rooms at feasts. In the restaurants, they love to be up in those exclusive rooms up on the top where the rich and important people get to go. 40, he says, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense, that's a show, make long prayers, these shall receive greater damnation. So he said, don't be impressed by these religious celebrities. And that's true even of today. We got all these big mega church preachers with these huge churches and huge followings and living like rock stars, big mansions all over the country, Lear jets, expensive cars, diamonds and Rolex watches and strutting around, showing, flaunting all their money and wealth off. And he says they devour widows' houses. How did they get rich? Lying to a bunch of stupid people who won't pick up a Bible and pray to, for their understanding. That's how they got rich. Lying to people and getting their money. Some little widow sending all their money in because Reverend is telling them that if you sow a seed of a $1,000, God's going to wipe out all your financial debt. And that little woman is dumb as a box full of rocks. And she's constantly sending her money to them and ain't getting none of her debt wiped out. Just getting further and further in debt. That's why it says they devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, they make long prayers. Pretense is to put on a show. So you'll see these big mega church preachers in these huge arena sized churches. And sometimes they rent out arenas and have their so-called traveling ministries like T.D. Jakes. And they get up there and they put on a show, they give these long prayers and sometimes they start talking in tongues. <laughs> put on a show. And the people, oh, 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 oh he's so holy. Oh, he's so righteous. Oh. <laughs> And it's just pathetic because if they read the Bible, they would see the Bible does not teach that that's what's supposed to be happening. But he says at the end of that 40th verse, these shall receive greater damnation. Let's deal with that. Greater is 40, 55. It means more superabundance in degree or character. So it's worse than your average. And that word damnation is 2917 in the Strong's Concordance. It's kima. 
and it means a decision, the function or the effect for or against a crime. So they are going to suffer worse than your average person on judgment day. That's what Jesus is teaching. They are going to burn in almost the lowest part of the abyss. The only ones going to be lower than them is the fallen angels and Satan. They're going to be in the worst part of the lake of fire. But the false teachers are going to be right above them cooking in that fire, screaming and hollering. It ain't going to get no relief. It ain't going to get out. Okay? So that's why when you've been enlightened through the spirit to see what it really is, and it makes your blood boil, know that they're not going to get away with it. Nobody's getting away with nothing. Everybody has to go past the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things that they've done in their body, whether they were good or bad. Remember that. Verse 41. And Jesus set over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. So he was watching the people go up to throw money in there. And many that were rich cast in much. So you had a bunch of big shots going up there like, watch me. And dump a whole bag of coins in there. Look how righteous and generous I am. <laughs> Take care. Make sure you get that good side. 42. And there came a certain poor widow. A little poor woman came in there. Husband's gone. She's all by herself. And she threw in two mites, which make a far thing. Now, mites was a measurement of money. So she put in two mites, which make a fart thing. So I'm going to just bring it up to modern day times to try to help you guys understand. Let's say she threw in two nickels, which would make a dime. So you can understand that. That's not exactly what it was, but you understand that, right? So she put all she had in there. 43. And he called to him to him his disciples and said to them surely i say to you that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which cast into the treasury so he said come here that little lady right there she put in more money than all these rich people going up there showing off putting money in the treasury 44 for all they did cast in of their abundance. See, they got plenty of money. So they can go up in there and dump a whole bag of coins in there. And they got a lot more where that came from. He says, all they did of their abundance put in their money. They had plenty of money. But she, of her want, did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Now, I want you to get this. This poor little lady, she loved God Almighty, and she just wanted to give back something. And so she took the two little mites she had, all she had, no job, no pension, no house, no nothing probably, and put it in there. She probably lived in some little raggedy African that are falling apart. Christ said she put in more than all of them. What's the point, Minister Porter? The point is, it's not the amount that you give to the work of God. It's the motive. That's right. Not the amount that you give, but the motive. If you're not giving whatever you're giving to the work of God, because you love God and you love your fellow man, then you're just giving. If this particular Bible study has been a blessing to you and you want to bless me with a love gift of any amount, this is how you can do that. Go to paypal.com, download the PayPal app. It's free. Then you would use this code to send me your love gift paypal.me slash Barton Porter. You can also download the free cash app. My code is cash.app slash dollar sign 
Barton 1014. And then there are people who prefer Zell. For Zell, all you need is my name, Barton Porter, and my phone number, which is 630-441-4563. Now, here are non-financial ways you can be a blessing to yours truly in this ministry. I need your prayer, saints. Pray for Minister Porter and pray for this ministry. And share the Bible study videos. If you're being blessed or encouraged or taught through this ministry, share these Bible study videos with as many people as possible. And if you have any Bible questions or prayer requests, you can call me at 630-441-4563. I live in Illinois, so I'm in the central time zone. And if you don't have a phone, you can email me, Porter at gmail.com. I need you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please hit the subscribe button. It does not cost you a penny. And underneath the video also, after you hit the subscription button, there's a little bell icon. Click on that bell icon. That bell is the notification icon. Every time a video is released, you will get a notification. And underneath the video, there's two thumbs, one up, one down. If you like my video, if you like the content, please take the time to hit that thumbs up button. And please take the time to put something in the comment section. Now, these shirts that you see me wear all the time are my own designs. I have an online t-shirt store. It's godwear.store. So please check out the t-shirts, the hoodies, the women tees, the cups. If you see something you like, buy it because you're getting something that you can use to share the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere you go. And you're also blessing this ministry as well. So until next time, this is Minister Barton Aaron Porter saying, may the good Lord continue to bless you and keep you all the days of your life. God bless you and goodbye.